The Glattfelter Hall is one of the most striking and the most memorable buildings on campus and I'm going to talk about it in three slightly different ways to use it to illuminate three different aspects of both the history of this area and of Gettysburg College. Um, and I have to say that because I'm a relative newcomer to Gettysburg's campus, I learned a lot from the late Professor Norm Fornes' history of this building, which he published um, a number of years ago. So I'm very grateful to him and I rely on him throughout my talk. But I'm going to talk first about uh, a little about how this building, Glattfelter Hall, illustrates the geologic history of Gettysburg, the area. And then I'm going to talk a little about its association with the Glattfelter family. And then finally, how this building represents a particularly optimistic and energetic phase of Gettysburg College's development in the late 19th century. So I want to start literally at ground level with the foundation stone of the building, which is an igneous rock called diabase. And the diabase was formed um, about 145 to 199 million years ago during the Jurassic, when a giant slab of molten rock was thrust up into an older formation of sandstones, siltstones, and shales called the Gettysburg Formation. And this diabase, this igneous extrusion, um, which is called the Gettysburg Sill, cooled very quickly and so the rock is very dense, it's very tight grained, it makes a great foundation stone. It's also uh, the rock that underlies locally famous geologic features like Seminary Ridge, Cemetery Hill, the Two Round Tops, Culps Hill and those kinds of places. Um, it's interesting, I said it was a good foundation stone and it is, but in recent years there's been some geologic activity in the Dillsburg area just north of here. Now many residents at that time reported hearing gunshots during the slight tremors or earthquakes and later they found out that it was diabase cracking. So while it's a good foundation stone, you see it all across Adams County in the local area. When it goes, it goes with a bang, apparently. Um, Above the diabase, there is one point, there are 1.2 million bricks that were used in the creation of the building. And there's also a lot of Hummelstown brownstone trim, which kind of accents the building. There were so many bricks used to create the building that the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad actually built a small spur to campus to drop those bricks off. The brownstone trim, which comes from Hummelstown, north of here in Pennsylvania, uh, it really marks the building as a Victorian era building. This was a very popular kind of decorative stone accent during the time. And Hummelstown became so famous for this brownstone trim that its quarries have been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's very easy to work with. It's sometimes called freestone. And uh, it's used on lots of public and private buildings throughout the United States. It's used on the, um, the old engineering building at Penn State. It was used at the Barber County Courthouse in Philippi, West Virginia, and a lot of it was shipped out to Chicago, sold to dealers, and then sent to points west. So it's all throughout the United States. In 1888, though, when those bricks and that brownstone were being brought to campus and assembled into this building, this was not Glattfelter Hall at that time. It was simply called the New Recitation Building, or more familiarly, the New Hall. And it was the first uh, major building built on campus since Penn Hall had been built earlier in the 19th century. Uh, although it wasn't called Glattfelter Hall, the Glattfelter family's association with the building was deep and it has been of long standing. The Glattfelter referenced in the actual name of the building is Philip H. Glattfelter. He was the great-great-grandson of Swiss immigrants his generosity to the college was enabled by his success uh, as an owner of a paper mill. He bought a paper mill in Spring Grove, Pennsylvania in 1864 for $14,000, expanded its operations, and that is actually the predecessor of the Glattfelter Company, which is today based in York, Pennsylvania. P.H. Glattfelter's success as a paper uh, mill manufacturer helped enable his generosity to the college. He himself was not a student here, but his son, William Glattfelter, was. The construction of the building was first proposed in the early 1880s. And at that point, uh, P.H. Glattfelter pledged $10,000. In 1884, Harvey McKnight became president of the college and the fundraising for the building really intensified. Plans were drawn up by a York-based architect called John Dempwolf, and the cornerstone was actually laid on June the 27th, 1888. Now, Glattfelter had pledged $10,000 at the outset. However, he was called upon later as well to pledge more money. In fact, at the building's dedication, after it was built, and the dedication took place on September the 11th, 1889, the then chairman of the Board of Trust Trustees, John Gray, stood up and said, here's the building, isn't it wonderful? Actually, we're $20,000 short. And does anyone want to step forward and pledge that amount of money? 
and one imagines there might have been a slightly uncomfortable pause and then P.H. Glattfelter stood up and said, I will pledge that $20,000. Mr. Grafe went on to raise more money during the course of the meeting, so I guess the message is that you should come to these opening ceremonies with your checkbook in hand. But um, P.H. Glattfelter continued to be a friend to the college over the next uh, few decades. He was on the board of trustees from 1888, the year of the building's dedication, to 1907, and he was president of the board from 1900 to 1904. His son William, who inherited the paper mill business, was a trustee from 1908 to 1930. The building became officially Glattfelter Hall in 1912, and the family's financial generosity to the building and to the college actually continued. William Glattfelter, when renovations were proposed in the 1920s, uh, pledged $100,000 together with his sisters towards renovating the building. And Professor Charles Glattfelter, who I think you'll hear from elsewhere in these talks, has estimated that the family as a whole gave over $200,000 to the college and a lot for its building projects over the course of a 40 year period. Uh, now going back to the 1880s, when this building was first being constructed on campus, it really represented, as I said at the outset, an optimistic and a forward-looking aspect of the college's development. The basic aim in making this building was to modernize the college. Uh, the president President McKnight wanted to separate the academic from the residential aspects of the university. Those had been combined in Penn Hall, but it was a sign of a modern college that it would have separate places for students to live and a place for students to study. Um, there was also a suggestion, there's an article that came out in the Gettysburg Times in, 18, in 1988 at the building's centenary that the college was interested in having more fireproof building, one in which the stoves were not in the individual rooms. Um, so that was another desire of the college at the time. When the building was dedicated, it had six halls, six large um, spaces for the, the college to occupy. Two were dedicated to the college's literary societies. One was a museum, one was a library, and two were left empty for the college to kind of grow into. The building also housed nine classrooms. It housed a, an infirmary and a doctor's consulting room and it housed the college president's office. Initially, there was supposed to be a further wing of the building on the west side that was to be a chapel for the college. But um, as the building was being constructed, the Brewer family actually offered a separate endowment that became Brewer Hall, which was the college's chapel until the 1950s when uh, the, the, a need was felt to expand the, the chapel and the current chapel, Christ Chapel, was built and Brewer Hall became what it is now a fine arts building. Um, in terms of its looks, in terms of how the building looks, Glattfelter looks a lot like it did in 1889. Um, it's generally agreed that the architect, John Dempwolf, was influenced by the work of a Boston architect named H. H. Richardson, who was part of what has come to be called the Romanesque Revival. Uh, in that revival, or as part of it, architects revisited a lot of mo motifs from medieval Europe, towers, turrets, rounded arches. The great tower of Glattfelter Hall is 143 feet high. Professor Fornes has pointed out that architects of this era were less concerned with authenticity than they were with creating a certain sort of feel. So Glattfelter Hall doesn't reproduce what a medieval building would have looked like. It was essentially a system of if they liked something, if they wanted a tower, they wanted a turret, they would throw it in. And it's kind of a hodgepodge or a pastiche. In 1929, Windows were added to the north and west sides of the building to lighten it up a little. And then later renovations in the 1980s and the 1990s added a south tower to house um, an elevator. But basically, and also attic spaces were opened up and converted into academic space. But essentially the building looks very similar to the way it would have looked in the 1880s. If you look through past issues of the Gettysburgian, the campus newspaper, you'll find that Glattfelter Hall has been the site of sock hops. It has been the site of faculty and student struggles over whether smoking should be allowed in campus buildings. It's a building that has been occasionally closed by bomb threats. And it's the building uh, where Dwight D. Eisenhower announced in 1955 that his rumors about his health were ill-founded and that he would in fact run for re-election in 1956. So it's seen its share of history. Today, the building houses the departments of history, economics, sociology, anthropology, mathematics, computer science, political science, and Africana studies.